So this is the third lecture supplement video where I'm attempting to diagram German idealism. In this video we're going to talk about Fichte and his uh, subjective idealism as it is sometimes called. But first I want to review a little bit what we've discussed so far in looking at Kant's new transcendental method. So you'll remember for Kant there's the mind and the phenomenal realm. There are categories of understanding in here which determine our knowledge of uh, sensory objects in the world out here, right? Logical relations between these categories are akin to causal relations between these physical objects, right? This is the realm of phenomena, of space, or outer intuition and time, or inner intuition. This is the picture that Kant leaves us with after the theoretical, the critique of theoretical reason in his book, The Critique of Pure Reason. Um, he has two more critiques, the critique of practical reason, which has to do with uh, morality, and the critique of judgment, which has to do with uh, teleological judgments of purpose in the biological realm of organisms, as well as aesthetic judgments of art. And in the second lecture supplement, the last one, we talked mostly about the critique of judgment and the way that Kant realized that organisms, and here's, here's our treat again, display a form of causality that's quite different from uh, the form of causality that holds true of uh, mechanical objects, those that were subject to a Newtonian form of explanation. Organisms display uh, a causality that is circular or self-organizing in Kant's terms. And another important thing to recognize about organic causality or self-organization is that it's a form of organization wherein the whole seems to um, precede the parts such that there is an organizing principle at the level of the whole organism that tells the parts how to behave. In normal mechanical causality, it's uh, a form of linear causation where the cause is external to its effect, right? So that we're really talking in that case about systems wherein there are parts outside of other parts. The parts don't have any internal relationship to one another. Whereas in the case of organisms, the parts are in internal relationships to one another because they produce one another for the sake of establishing and maintaining the whole, right? So there's a whole over part type of causality in organisms, but it's just parts banging into parts in terms of, uh, in, uh, terms of the way physical objects behave. Kant says we have the categories to understand this mechanical type of causality, but we don't have those same categories for this organic type of causality. Kant says that it would take a scientific form of genius to intuit the wholeness underlying the self-organizing processes of, of organisms in order to have any scientific knowledge of how that's done. Kant didn't think there could be such a genius. Uh, Schelling and Goethe, as we will see, did think there could be such a genius. So this is the Kantian situation. Let's move on to Fichte. So for Fichte, he starts with the Kantian picture. There is a unity of apperception or self-consciousness in the subject and a phenomenal realm of objects. And remember, Kant thought that beyond the phenomenal realm, there was just this mere X, this realm of things in themselves that we can't know anything about. Fichte eliminates the thing in itself. He says, there is no such thing. There is only the activity of the self, of the absolute ego. And so you'll remember, for Kant, uh, practical philosophy or moral philosophy was centered around this experience of conscience, our feeling of freedom, and our, our duty which for Kant was described in terms of the categorical imperative, our duty to be moral, right? Uh, and I symbolize this with the crucifix. For Fichte, for all intents and purposes, this Christian uh, form of morality, a rationalized form of Christianity that Kant uh, articulates, um, is replaced by Fichte with the activity of the absolute self. So the crucifix becomes an I, 
And this isn't the empirical or finite I, it's not our uh, sense of individual personality. For Fichte, the absolute ego is a transcendental ideal that is shared by finite individuals. There is an ethical self that is more than just me or just you, but um, it's, a, it's an absolute self that all finite human beings participate in, right? So Fichte is no solipsist. And whereas Kant had this realm of things in themselves, for Fichte, he gets rid of this, and instead of there being an unknowable realm of, of noumena, there are, rather, other selves. So for Fichte, the activity of, of the absolute ego, in order to become conscious of itself, needs to be checked by something. It needs to face a limit to its own infinite activity. That's other selves. Fichte describes uh, the summons of other self-consciousnesses that throw us back upon ourselves, increasing our own uh, consciousness of ourselves. Right, so there's a dialectic that unfolds here, whereby in an, our attempt to become conscious of ourselves in light of the existence of other self-consciousnesses, we know I can't be the only consciousness in this universe, we begin to reflect inwardly thereby uh, on ourselves and thereby objectifying ourselves. So Fichte says there's an original act by which we constitute not only the entire phenomenal world, but also the categories by which we would understand that world. So whereas for Kant, we had these categories that he basically lifts from Aristotle, uh, who wrote them down 2,000 years earlier, Fichte says we need to show how these categories are generated by free acts of the absolute ego. So there's a generative process whereby this, the absolute self gradually limits its own experience, including uh, creating space and time, cre creating the categories by which to determine objects, and uh, entering into an ethical relationship of what he calls mutual recognition, whereby other self-consciousnesses, again, intensify our own consciousness of ourselves. We are summoned by others to become more conscious of ourselves, and initially, uh, in seeking for the absolute ego that would underlie my experience of all of space and time, all of nature, um, what I find first is an objectified self, which is not what I was looking for initially. So the dialectic continues, and, and the genesis of all of the categories, as well as space and time for Fichte, follows from um, this dialectic, this search for the original act by which the entirety of the world is created. So we end up being, for Fichte, bound up in a, an ethical community whereby for me to in, increase and intensify my own self-consciousness, uh, I need the self-consciousness of others. And so there's a way in which other members of our ethical community play a constitutive role in the construction of our own consciousness. So again, Fichte is not a solipsist. He's not closing us into our own subjectivity. He's saying that for us to become conscious of ourselves already presupposes other consciousnesses outside of us. And what he really means by the absolute ego is an ethical community within which uh, finite beings can become conscious of themselves and conscious of their responsibility to one another. Um, so that the absolute ego is in some sense an ethical community. or a social self. Where, what happens to nature in this picture? Well, nature is sort of this realm of phenomena that exists between free human agents, moral creatures. And the goal of human life, from Fichte's point of view, is to, by exercising our freedom as moral agents in an ethical community, to transform the empirical realm of nature, of, of phenomena and appearances, into uh, 
a stage upon which we can more easily realize our own freedom. Nature initially presents us uh, with resistance to our free ac our, our attempts to act freely. And Fichte's goal is for human beings to overcome that resistance, gradually transforming nature uh, into uh, our own image in a way, such that it is um, the purpose of human life to annihilate nature, to make room for freedom.